This is a reading from the notebooks by Marie Voltorta, 1944, October the 16th. I open the Bible, chapter 23 of Ecclesiasticus, verses 1 to 4, presents itself. It is a prayer I like. It is so easy for the mind to grow haughty and the heart to swell with pride. No, death rather than this, for this would mean to lose you, Lord, and I don't want to lose you. Use whips and scourges, but keep your violet on the ground. At twelve I say to Jesus, Yes, Lord, lead me by the hand. I was reading a sentence dictated to Sister Benigna, the servant of God, Benigna Consolata Ferrero, 1885-1916, to a sister of the Visitation in Como. I was reading a sentence dictated to Sister Benigna, by Jesus, which was thought was my thought for the day. I want what you want and nothing else, but I am afraid of the world. Jesus replies to me, He who knows what kind of fear I am talking about, if they should impose silence, silence on you in not recognizing that by my name and will you do what you are doing, answer as Peter and John replied to the, San, to the Sanhedrin after the healing of the lame man. Judge for yourselves whether it is right before God to obey you rather than God. We, I, cannot fail to speak about what we, I, have seen and heard. Acts chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. Besides, you could not keep me from coming to you and forcing you to see and hear, and it would be foolishness in you to listen to the world that wants to impose silence on God rather than God who wants to give light to the world. If I will, who can go against me? We omit the episode written on October the 17th involving Judas Thaddeus, a visit to Bethsaida to invite Jesus to the wedding in Cana, found in this cycle on the first year of the public life. <clears throat> I continue with October the 18th. I write as best I can in the twilight. One of the poor creatures has left who contribute to making this place of exile St. Andrea di Compito, even more unbearable for me. She left after having made a display of her culture. As I listened to her, I thought of you, my master, and your lessons, true lessons which educate in a knowledge which is bred for the spirit in addition to the intellect, and I felt repugnance at this other poor science which does not have the taste of you. I cannot pray because I am still thinking, and you lead me to see. There you are, I see you, my incarnate God, blazing and majestic, standing upright in the purest ether. You are alone. I see only you, glorious in your appearance as king of creation. Your robe of immaterial, pearly substance shines, and your glorified flesh, which is at once flesh and light, shines more. O beauty unknown to so many who do not take care to act in such a way as to know you one day, O oh, my beauty, who cancel out all my affliction by showing yourself. Jesus does not speak, but he invites me with his gaze to go to him, and I go. My spirit rises, breathed in by his desire and spurred on by mine, up to my king. And he says, Look, no, compare. And with his luminous hand, on which there is the ruby of the wound, points to a boundless heavenly horizon. Yes, for I am elevated beyond spaces, beyond the stratosphere, into realms where there is nothing but stars and ether, no more clouds or dust or winds. That is, there is still one wind, the singing, harmonious wind created by the movement of the stars. I comprehend that Jesus, without words, wants to show me the truth of, his, of this stellar sign. Oh, how different it is from the poor conception stated a, a little while ago, and all the others I have known until now. I shall make an effort to express it. The stars already formed race straight on like projectiles fired point-blank from a cannon, slither like snakes in the blue, rotate while running on their axes, and dance like festive children on the ethereal meadow. The light throbs with every movement, almost as if the joy of motion and of obedience to the laws of the Creator made their burning bodies more incandescent. The only fixed one, the sun, an enormous globe of gold, fused to the burning topazes, metal, and jewels, compared to which our most beautiful ones are filthy pebbles and dull brass, 
beams out its light ever the same. It looks like a huge votive lamp adoring the majesty of God. How many stars! My gaze goes on and on, and stars and planets are everywhere. How many unknown stellar lives! How much unknown radiance! How many mysteries of words up here, and of lives! Stars purifying themselves in their swift race by losing their aura and scoriae, which fuse with those of other stars and create the nuclei for new lives, star dust forming a way for numberless little lives, small in comparison to planets, and incalculably large in comparison to the nothingness of a human body. And this way, entirely luminous, a real fish pond of stars, every once in a while lets one of its lives of light, a flower, abandoning its native flower bed, and it goes to complete itself by a process I am unable to explain, feeding on substances it carries off on its way, and a new star is born, or rather has been isolated, to say to the man discovering it, I too exist, and other stars, still in the process of being formed, move along with the wake of their combustion and solidification as a mantle of flame or head of hair unbound and extended by the wind of movement, and all of this on a meadow of an ethereal blue, where the purest turquoise and the most precious bright sapphire are so pale and dull by comparison that they lose value. Oh, the light of the heavenly fields! Oh, why am I unable to express better these unions, formations, and separations, and this inexhaustible flourishing of lives, the obedience, beauty, and majesty of the world of stars? But, although the light of this boundless garden of stars, which is the firmament, is such that the mind of a poet or scientists cannot even remotely conceive of it, Jesus now makes a movement. He simply removes his gaze from the stars to turn towards the left and behind him. An order must be darting from his thought, a desire, but I hear no word. An angel swiftly comes and prostrates himself in adoration at the Savior's feet. And Jesus says to me, Compare this light to those lights. He says nothing else. Indeed, the angel, and there is just one, is shining more than all the stars together. On October the 19th, Jesus says, And now I shall speak to you. I have shown you only one angel, a simple angel, not a seraph or a cherub or an archangel, an angel, the smallest one, I would say, to have you understand that he is an ordinary one in the midst of the exulting ranks in heaven. And you saw that his light which gives an incorporeal body to his essence, which is entirely spirit, darkened the light of all the stars placed together. With the desire of my thought I called an angel, and he came from the furthest Empyrean, and between my calling him and his being at my feet, not even that fraction of time which you call a second passed. I wanted this to show you that those who think they are learned, because they know the not always exact and never complete dogmas of human science, and think they are the possessors of oceans of light and truth and beauty, have only a little particle, and it is joined to a lot of dross. You said, How many mysteries up there? Yes, little star of your master, life does not stop in this creation. It does not stop in any part of it. It will not stop until I say, Enough. And in keeping with my thought, I shall change the appearances and laws which for thousands of centuries I have given to life. Life is the life of the ether, which, with its light solidity, facilitates and sustains the race and weight of the stars, and with its composition and iciness, permits their ever greater perfection on the way to that maximum which I have established for every life. Here my will is obeyed. Life is the life of the stars and planets, which, starting as nebulae, let us call them star fetuses, being formed in the great womb of the ethereal air, slowly solidify and nourish themselves like the voracious mouths of infants, carrying off gases and metals from the lives already formed, as an infant carries off food and drink from the breast of a wet nurse. The unsleeping race of all these starry lives itself permits this flow of their molecules, gases, and metals, which ignite the nebulae, and in the fire they fuse into the first core, and concentrate more and more, and then the flame becomes a fire, and the fire a star. Marriages and births, births and marriages, and the deaths of long-lived stars, which on disintegrating in the final convulsion of life, create a nucleus for other lives, 
latent in the great river of Galathea, nor is there a single one which does not have a loving mission for you as well, who are far off, billions of kilometers away, but even farther for you, are no longer able to see with the eyes of the children of God. I have shown you this stardust, dust, in comparison to the blazing of my angel, but, little daughter, for whom I lift up veils of mystery to make you forget the earth and fall more and more deeply in love with my country, what are we to call the dust of those who are only are great only in pride and bear the name man? No, they would not see, they would not believe, even if by a miracle of power I made them see. They have chewed on the bread and fruit of pride in human science. It drives them mad. I have given and am giving pages of truth and holiness, but for too many they fall to the ground like crumbs of base straw. Men, let us give them the title of rank, according to their conception. Do not take care of these words. Man ought to mean a child of God made in the image and likeness of the Father in thoughts, affections, acts, impulses and desires. That is what children are. However, at present, man means the animal that is the proudest, emptiest, cruelest, most thoughtless, most thoughtless and most contrary to God. He thinks he is everything. He is nothing. Nothing because he is just man and no longer a child of God. Where is man's spirit who still possesses one? Daughter, let us leave these unfortunates to their sad fate, seeking with love to tear them away from it. There is nothing but love that can do what nothing else can. But although it is the most, although it is the powerful one, it is often rendered powerless because it clashes against the pride which is resistant to every assault by good. They think they are gods because the corrosive of the fruit of human knowledge is on their lips. Adam does not die. He is reborn with his tendency in every man. Adam was lost because he wanted to know and, and know to become a god. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. Come to the children of the light, the children of God. Let there be given the bread and the fruit of truth and wisdom, which are not only for what is inherent in God alone, but also since everything has come from God. For what is in the universe, long for heaven. Here there will be no more dissonance between you and those at your side. Here there will be no more contrast between your desiring and your possessing. Here you will rest blissfully and festively. Here you will have me, if possessing me amidst the constrictions of your condition, as one living on earth gives the joy which exalts you, consider what having me with no more limits will be like. Life passes, heaven comes, pain dies, blessedness remains. Those who have loved me and served me will be the eternal stars when every star is dead at the end of creation. My stars.